I'm Dr. Wendy Trubo, MD, MBA, and I'm so psyched that Nafisa Parpia is here today. She is a board certified naturopathic doctor. She spent the last decade treating patients with complex chronic illnesses. She did significant training with Drs. Dietrich Klinghardt and Dr. Isaac Elias, both of whom are, I'm a huge fan. And Dr. Parpia's targeted system of care includes a synergistic blend of regenerative medicine, micronutrient peptide therapies, functional nutrition, lifestyle counseling, and more. Nafisa, welcome. I'm so grateful you're here and that we can talk about this. Thank you for being here. Wendy, thank you for inviting me. It's such an important oh. topic and uh, people are really going to benefit. From yes. This. So let's dive in. You're really, really focusing on pre-talks. So what is a pre-talks? Yes. So I coined this term because I have so many patients who've come to me that they've tried to detox prior to coming and it, it went terribly. So they, maybe they had headaches from it or brain fog or joint pain or muscle pain. Most of my patients already have these symptoms, but then they got exacerbated from the detox, mm. right? So detox causes temporary inflammation that just comes with the territory. So now if these patients are already in a state of inflammation, if we try to detox them, it's just going to further increase the inflammation, right? So their mitochondria, instead of creating um, ATP for cellular use, they're now creating external ATP. That's the cell danger response. It's stage one of the cell danger response. They're in a state of oxidative stress and inflammation, and that's supposed to be temporary, but in a lot of these patients, it's not temporary anymore because they've had so many insults to their system. Those insults include environmental toxins and a multitude of infections. So now so, they're in the state. Yeah. So Go would ahead. these patients know that they needed a pretox if they had tried to do a detox and got sicker? Basically, these hypersensitive, highly reactive humans. I yeah, and the thing is, they don't know. So they try a detox. <sighs> And then they come and you've probably had this happen too. They say, don't, please don't put me through a detox. I don't, I don't want to do that again. I've tried it. It was horrible. Then I say, okay, we've got to take a step back and, and try to understand why this happened to you. And, and then let's prepare you. And that, that's a very deep and personalized process for each patient. So talk to me about who are the people who typically need a, a pretox? I think we've landed on it, but I want to really drill into that. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to start with a caveat, right? So our bodies were designed to eliminate toxins and cellular waste naturally, but we didn't evolve to catch up with this burden of environmental toxins in our environment. That's just not how, how we were designed. We haven't caught up with that yet. I don't know if we ever will, right? So this constant exposure to toxins results in an increased toxic load in people. More research shows that environmental toxins, chronic low-grade exposures do cause autoimmunity and they do cause immune dysregulation. Mm -hmm. So the patients who suffer from complex chronic illnesses I'm finding, actually, this is the majority of my patients, they need pretox first because they're coming in a highly inflamed state in a state of oxidative stress. So this includes patients who have autoimmune conditions, fibromyalgia, um, chronic Lyme, long haul syndrome, post-infectious illnesses, all these mystery cases, mystery illnesses. Usually underneath that is oxidative stress and inflammation that's driven by a combination of environmental toxins and infections. I'm laughing as you're saying this, Nafisa, because I'm thinking about, you know, the patients who walk in and they say, I have, you know, this list of diagnoses and they're all chronic. And I'm thinking what you have is inflammation and mitochondrial dysfunction and, and toxic exposure and stress. So I'm thinking at a, of it as a totally different way. And I'm laughing as you say these things, because I feel like we're on the same page that, that you're not your diagnosis. You, you, what's happening underneath that is that your body is, is in a state of stress and oxidative stress. So, okay. So before we dive into what a pretox is, I think you and I are also on the same page because I'm not a fan of, I don't believe that quick fixes work. And uh, you alluded before we got on camera to uh, quick cleanses, detox programs. Talk to me about the difference between a pretox, a detox, and a quick cleanse. Okay, so so when when we're doing a pretox, we're really taking into the consider taking into consideration why the patient can't handle that detox. Not only that, but why do they have these nebulous 
these nebulous symptoms that have been very, very hard for doctors to pin down. Usually these patients are given waste basket diagnoses or there's no diagnosis or they're told this is all in your head. We can't figure this out. So we're going to send you to psychiatry, right? So right away, we know there's something else going on and you're inflamed. You're in oxidative stress. We can test this on the labs. And of course I do, I'm sure you do also. How inflamed are you? How much um, oxidative stress are you under and why? So I'm looking for the root causes. Now, if um, if a patient has stress in their organs of elimination, their liver, their kidneys, uh, their lungs, then I know they're not ready for a detox and, and I want to pre-tox them first. Um, and, and what, what were you, you, you asked something. Well, I want to know about the things that people think of typically like a juice cleanse or a three-day fast or some type of quicker program that a lot of people buy into thinking, oh, I'm going to detox, but it makes them sicker or it doesn't get them where they want to go. What's your, how do you compare that to detox? Okay. So, so first of all, everything I was just talking about, these things need to be evaluated for the person's not ready for a quick a quick fix detox, because when that happens, we might start flushing toxins and we're going to increase stress in the body. We're going to increase inflammation. We're going to put more stress on the mitochondria, right? That might even cause underlying infections to, to, to surface and become more active. So first of all, we want to investigate why. Second of all, a lot of these times, these quick, uh, these quick fixes are, are not um, they're not they're not taking into account what the person is currently exposed to. Maybe they have an exposure of mold, and therefore mycotoxins in their house. Maybe they're not taking into account um, heavy metals. Maybe the person has osteoporosis. When we have osteoporosis, lead that's been stored in the bones gets gets released as the bones turn over, and so this needs to be medically supervised and. The quick fixes are not medically supervised. And so when you're not understanding what's happening in the patient at the medical level, it's just going to fail, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that a lot of people think of detox as a a casual thing to do, but I I actually consider it to be medical in nature. Not only that, we want to test the environmental toxins, their genes of detoxification, their genes of inflammation, how high are your load of metals? Are you having acute exposure of metals? Do you have a body burden of metals? How about pesticides, glyphosate, <laughs> mycotoxins, like I mentioned before? There's so much to discover that's pertinent to each patient that's just not regarded in a quick fix detox. That's yeah, I always de- say to people, you're not going to untangle the problems of the past 10 to 20 years with something that lasts three to five days. It's a, I think I always say to people, think of that if you're healthy enough to do one of those, think of that like a reset. You're, you're prepping the body for going down a different path instead of the one you're on. But it's not like you do it for three days and then you're good. It's like you do it for three days or five days. And then that sets you on a new path for, for changing your behavior and changing your detox approach. So I think of it more like the entry point as opposed to the end point. Exactly. But some people can't even handle that entry point. Right. Those are my patients, right? The ones with Lyme disease or um, a chronic Lyme, I'm talking about not acute Lyme, even, even someone with acute might not be able to handle that. But, right. but autoimmunity, for instance, they probably can't even handle the entry point. But right. someone who's in decent shape, they just need a little bit of balancing, they can handle an entry point. But like you're saying, there's so much more to it than that. Just so- tap tip. So how would people know, I mean, why, why can some people handle it and some people can't, you know, when the, these people who are listening, they know who they are. They know that they can't handle the excursions, the challenges, why them when their sibling, their parent, their cousin, they don't have those reactions. Like what, how do you explain that? Right. I see this in my, in my patients all the time. I have like, it's usually, um, it's often women who, who have, who have had um, more inflammation in their bodies and, and and it's often their husbands or or their siblings right and they don't understand why 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 is she sick but i'm not a lot of times these people face isolation because of that that's a whole other topic on of its own actually um but 
So what I'm talking about is root causes of complex chronic illness and how that's unique to each person due to epigenetic expression. It's about environment meeting the genes and, and the role of environmental factors and the body's internal mechanisms. So say more about that. Like, I, I think we've covered epigenetics, but just for the listeners, say a little bit more about the impact of what your, what happened in your grandparents and is now impacting you. Right. So, so genes don't have to express, but when, when certain factors of the environment meet the genes, they trigger those genes to express. So we know that usually when there's genes that express, which are um, causing a stress in the body, it's due to inflammation and it's due to, to stressors from often from the outside. Mm -hmm. So in my patients, I'm seeing it as environmental toxins, infections, causing these certain genes to trigger. So what are these genes? Depends on the person. It depends on the genetic tendencies. Mm -hmm. It could be a GI issue. It could be, um, brain fog it could be it could be headaches or all of the above even so it's very interesting to look at patients genetic tendencies on the testing and then marry that with the environmental toxins or marry that with whatever the other stressors are there's genetic tests out there they can do that and and then we can understand a lot more about how a patient is expressing epigenetically and then how we can um how we can mitigate that really. Right. I think it's so, so there's two parts to this. One is your genes play a critical role that whether your genes are turned on or off plays a critical role, but that's not the end of the story because the other part of that is the way you were born and the way you were fed when, after you were born and the food you ate and whether you had antibiotics as a child or frequent ear infections or whether you ate like me and had sloppy Joe's for dinner. I mean, my mom cooked them, but they were still sloppy Joe's on right. a bun uh -huh. And whether you microwaved your food and whether you had toxic relationships and whether you, you, you sort of, you can think about it piles on because by the time you get to the age, you have a chronic disease, you've had a lot of things piling on, on top of your genes. Right. And so then the bottom line with this is that each of these is different than each person, right? Each person's diet when they were growing up was different. Each person's relationship stressors are different. There's physiological disturbances that are different. For example, if there's stress in the connective tissue and the muscles, if they're tight, that's going to, um, that's going to affect lymphatic flow. So you're not going to have as much drainage. There's so many different factors that are different to each individual from the history to, from, from the history of, well, we'll say relationships, history of diet, um, where you've lived, toxins, different exposures, the way the way your 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 body is is even built, injuries, all of those stressors are different for each person, and then that triggers genes which are different for each person, and that's why some people are more affected by toxins than others. So what I tell my patients is it's never just one toxin, it's never just one bug, it's it's usually many many. Um, factors. Yeah. It's such a beautiful way to put it. And you alluded to, I think the impact of social isolation. Can you talk about that and how it, like, what does it play? How does that play on physical health, the emotional and, and psychological health? Right. So, so a lot of my patients who have complex chronic illness, well, all of them do have complex chronic illness, but a lot of them have um, emotional, I'd say it, emotional struggles with it, okay? not because there's something wrong with them inherently, which is what they're often told, right? Um, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You have, uh, you have issues or you're lazy or you're crazy. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. So it's very often that um, inflammation can, can cross the blood brain barrier and that can alter mood that can that can cause brain fog. It can it can um, work on your your master. Or it can inflame the the, uh, the 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 hormones, the pituitary mm -hmm. gland, right? So mm -hmm. that can then have an effect on mood. So there's so many reasons that a patient's mood can be affected, and 
then that leads to social isolation. A lot of times um, people are isolated by their family or by their friends. People don't understand them anymore. They feel alone in their suffering. And um, that's, that's very difficult. So I work with my patients on that, on that piece, but also how is that linked? Well, we know that stress causes immune dysregulation or it amplifies immune dysregulation at the very least. So now they already have immune dysregulation due to infections, due to toxins, due to physiological disturbances, maybe due to relationships. And now that's exacerbated by the trauma of, of being sick. And not only that, but um, the central nervous system, it, it gives us signals to heal or to not heal. Mm -hmm. So actually it's why peptides work because they're signaling molecules, right? So they signal that it's time to heal instead of time to put our defenses up. Mm -hmm. Just like a lot of the, you know, different medications or different herbs that we use, we can, we can use the signaling molecules or we can use ones to put the defenses up, right? But the emotions mirror that as well. So, so working, working with patients to, to bring the defenses down, to feel safe again, um, there's so many ways to do that, but it's, it's a key piece. It's so funny as you were talking, you know, I have celiac and I historically have been super sensitive to, to gluten to the point where I stopped eating out. I don't eat at my friend's houses and I'm, as long as I don't eat gluten, I'm totally fine. But the social isolation of not being able to be with people really took a toll years. Or, you know, I mean, it's been 16 years. And I'm finally now at the place having done peptides and having done um, LDA and having done gluten free and mold removal and toxins removal. Like, it's done a lot of work. But I'm finally, recently, I was able to eat out and not be sick. And I had this moment of hope, like, oh, I could actually be connected to people over a meal at their house, right? Because I'm happy to cook, but sometimes people want to reciprocate. So it's, it, it really is a core component of health, which is being connected to others. And, and I will second that not being connected can be really bad for your health, you know, because it's isolating. It's terrible. So I, I, I totally can get what you're talking about because it's personal to me. Yeah, I'm sorry that you had to experience that. And I'm sure it gives you more compassion in working with your patients when they're facing it. Yeah, yeah. and it's just interesting. Like I really had to get, I think at some level I had to get the value of the connectedness to others, right? That it, it, it actually brought me home to how important it is to be connected to people because at first it didn't click and then I really got it. So it, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been a learning process, but I'm on the other side of it, I think. I'll keep yeah. you posted. It's so we ta- take for granted. Yeah, right? Like just being yeah. with people. Mm-hmm. So talk to me. Can you talk to me about the steps you walk people through? Like what we've talked about people needing a pre-tox and how you might think you you would be that person, but what do you actually do in a pre-tox? Right. So I'm I'm understanding the individual in front of me first. So I'm trying to understand the organs of elimination. So I'm understanding it by doing um, a clinical intake for them. I'm also doing a lot of labs for them. So the or- organs of elimination being the liver, the kidneys, the gut, the lungs, the skin. So if a patient is having issues in these organs of elimination, it's just the wrong time to be flushing toxins through. So I, the gut is a big one for a lot of people. There are a lot of people who might have constipation. So if if we're releasing toxins from a cellular level and the patient is constipated, we're just going to recirculate those toxins. So that's the wrong time to detox. If a patient has leaky gut syndrome, we can test for that as well. Then we can release uh, toxins from the cells, but those cells can translocate from the gut up to the brain via this highway of nerves that we have between the brain and the gut. So that's the wrong time to flush toxins. A lot of my patients have interstitial cystitis or they have um, chronic UTIs. I've seen chronic UTIs in women um, post-menopause. Usually it means they need some bioidentical hormone replacement therapy or they might need some vaginal um, hormone cream to to help with uh, fixing the cellular integrity of that area of their body before we're, we're ready to detox because we don't want to flush toxins through the system if uh, the genitourinary system is compromised. Mm-hmm. 
What if they're not sleeping adequately? Well, when we sleep is when um, the brain detoxes. When we sleep is when autophagy increases. That's that's uh, autophagy is removal of cellular waste and recycling it in the body. Mm-hmm. So if that's not happening, we're increasing the toxin load in the person causing further inflammation. So looking at the patient in front of me and working on um, on, on what how I'm going to set them up mm-hmm. to detox is really important. I'm checking their inflammatory status. I can, uh, I'm testing their inflammatory cytokines. And if they're in a state of immune dysregulation, which most of my patients are, right, they've got a hyperactive immune system on one hand, they've got mass cell activation syndrome, they've got autoimmune conditions. This is hyperactivity in the immune system. On the other hand, they have a weak immune system. They can't mount the appropriate um, immune response to kill off infections, right? Then the immune system needs some retraining. And so I'm, I'm retraining that with peptides. I tell my patients, it's like having an untrained fighter in the ring. So you've got this fighter in the ring that's throwing punches and kicks, but in the wrong sequence, at the wrong person, the timing is off. So I don't want to detox you yet. I've got to retrain the nervous system, the immune system first, or um, they, their, 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 their tissues are really tight in their neck, their shoulders. There's a lot of lymph right here. And then they wonder why their, pa- their, their face is becoming puffier or they're gaining weight. It's not that they're fat, mm-hmm. they're just inflamed. So these are the things we need to work with <clears throat> before starting the, starting the detox. How long do you tell people it's going to take? Like, do you say, look, you know, like the, the Eastern philosophy that it took you 20 years to get sick or it's going to take you a good amount of time to get better. How do you, how do you manage people's expectations around that? Right. I tell them, you know, you've, you've come to me at a time when you've been sick for a long, long time. Most of my patients have been sick for a, a minimum of one year. It's been often two, five, 10, some people 20 years. Mm-hmm. So I tell them, look, it took you this long to get sick. It's going to take some time to turn this around. I tell them often, I hope you like me because you're going to know me (laughs) for a long time. We're going to be on this journey together for a while. Um, Or sometimes I say, it's like, it's like turning a big ship around. You've come to me when you're a ship loaded with environmental toxins, loaded with infection. It takes some time to turn that around. But if if you were a kayak, we could just swiftly make that happen. So so we have to be patient and take it low and slow. And then there'll come a time when we can increase the rate of detox, increase the rate of killing infections, but we've got to start low and slow. Sometimes I tell them we've got to come in through the back door not the front door. If I come in bursting through the front front door and start to kill infections and detox you, you know, that's going to backfire. So I've got to come in very often with peptide therapies, balance the immune system, balance oxidative stress, and then we can come in and start infections. But usually when the patients are saying, thank goodness you're saying this actually, because I don't want to start fast. I know every time I've tried, it hasn't worked. Right. So what's the, yeah. qu- what's the quickest people have, someone has ever turn that ship around and been able to go from nothing to starting their journey. Yeah. I'm thinking in particular of a patient who, um, he was an athlete, really strong, really healthy. And um, he got bit by a tick. Ugh. And after that, his life went downhill. He could, it was a very difficult life. Um, his movements were compromised. His gut was compromised. Um, his sleep was compromised, energy was fatigued all the time. He came from another state. Um, he came from the East Coast and we're in California. He came and he stayed with us for treatment for six months. That was intensive treatment. So if someone comes from comes to us, from, a lot of people come from outside of the state actually, but if they come and they stay for six months, it's very often that we can do this intensely and quickly. Now, some people, they can't handle that kind of intensity or quickness, right? They have to come, come for a couple of weeks, go back home, come back again, again in a few months for a week or two, and we take it slow. So it depends on the patient, but some people can handle more aggressive treatment. I tell my patients, some patients are like bulls, and some are like butterflies, 
the bulls, I have to give Herculean doses of medicine to make anything move, right? Nothing outside the standard, but but I have to give them larger doses. Right. The butterflies, I just tap them. You wave little, it in front of them and they react. Their wings aren't going to crumble, right? So, so each patient is different. Some people just want to move fast and they can. Some people want to move fast. They can't. And then they say, actually, you know, I prefer to move slower. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it depends. It's really amazing, Nafisa, to think of it like that there's a system to approach healing that's systematic. It's really systematic and and it's personalized. So each person gets what they need, which is amazing. Really. Right. You know, is our patients have been to, the patients who come to our clinic have been to many other doctors before and they've tried the quick fixes like we just talked about yeah. um, in our interview and they haven't worked. So then often we're, we're you know, they're, they're fifth, sometimes 20th doctor. Mm-hmm. And, and we have to take a different approach. It has to be systematic and slow and very, very, very personalized. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned your clinic, where can people find you? Right. So we are in the San Francisco Bay area. The clinic is called Gordon Medical focusing on complex chronic illness. Got it. And before we wrap it up, is there anything else you'd want to share with people that I haven't asked you? Yeah, I want to share that hope is an important thing. I have hope for my patients. A lot of times they come into me and they're hopeless. And and so I spend a lot of time infusing hope into them. Well, first of all, I see patients get better, right? And, And very often there's an underlying reason that people get sick. And at some point in the middle of treatment, they say that. I say that because I've been told this over and over again by patients. They say, you know what? Had I not got sick, I wouldn't have been able to write that book or I wouldn't have been able to climb that mountain or I, I'm a better mom or a better dad since, mm-hmm. since I became sick because I, it increased my, my patience. It increased my trust in myself. It grounded me. What, whatever the reason is, there's always this silver lining and I know that a patient starts to become better, or I know that their their healing journey has taken a turn for improvement when they start talking like that. Mm-hmm. That's common. So I want people out there who are, who are sick and they don't know why they've got mysterious illnesses to know. First of all, you're not alone. And second of all, I see hope in my patients every day. And then I see that hope flourishing into actuality into the actuality of, of wellness. So funny you say that. Amen to that. I mean, I love that. Someone said to me once, what do you sell? I said, I sell hope (laughs) that there's, there's a transformation is in front of you and it's possible to achieve it. So it's just funny that I feel like you're talking my language, you know? I love it. Well, we have so much in common, Wendy. I know. I know. (laughs) I know we're on the, we're on the, the transcontinental, um, like, adore adoration society. I'm like, oh, I love yes, <laughs> we are. <laughs> so, okay. So we'll wrap it up here. So the Gordon, Gordon medical clinic, uh, okay. Gordon medical associates, but the, okay. the website is gordonmedical.com. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Nafisa for the listeners, this is a very, very special human. And, and I mean, I love the work that that they're doing out there. So feel free to look them up. And Nafisa, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Really, this is about hope and recovery. And I think you've started the process to give people a window, a you know, glimpse into the window of how to get there. So thank you. Wendy, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And I just adore you. 